Well, I think we might start a couple of minutes early. Uh, welcome and thanks for coming. Uh, I hope Marty, it's, everybody's here to hear Marty speak, so I'll try to get out of right away and, and we'll get Marty from CIO quickly. I'm Jack Harris with the Executive Director for the Statewide Internet Portal Authority, which is a mouthful. Uh, we're going to try to go by Colorado SIPA at this point. We kind of changed our logo a little bit to reflect the fact that we serve Colorado. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, I've been with the organization <coughs> since its founding in 2004. Uh, I was appointed originally to the board to represent local government. At that point, I was working for Douglas County. I started out as Douglas County's public trustee. Um, and then went on to become the corporate recorder, when I served in that capacity for eight years, was on the SIPA board. I was reappointed by three governors to serve on the board. I, I didn't know any of them, so I wasn't very sure why we kept reappointing you to the board. A couple of years ago, uh, our executive director went on, John Connolly, to do some other things. If you know John, he's now with Salesforce. Uh, and board said, would you consider coming on board as the executive director? So I'm in my fifth year now as executive director for SIPA. One thing I want to get clear early, um, you know, Chelsea spoke this morning. I hope you caught her speech. It was really quite spot on, I thought. But she did talk about jury duty. We're in the state court's building. The state's court's are my landlord, so we love state courts. If you're listening, I'm sure you have a great jury duty system, and please don't kick us out. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about SIPA. As I said, it started back in 2004. Um, it, it was interesting. We didn't know what we were doing at that point in 2004. We didn't know what kind of an organization we were going to be. Uh, Bill Owens was the governor at the time, and he gave us half a million dollars to figure out, or fifty thousand dollars to figure out what we were, were going to do when we grew up, and do a study and figure out how to run a state portal. Um, at that point, uh, Henry Sultanay was in charge of the state budget, um, and we were having fires in the state of Colorado. He came to us and said, "Give us all the money back." And so we found ourselves broke, uh, but with the need to start something that was this state portal vision. Um, at that point, uh, one of our board members, Senator Ron May, came to us and said, I've heard of this crazy company in Kansas that has a self-funded model. And so let's talk to them and see if we can use no money to get the portal started. Uh, they came to us, proposed what the self-funded model is. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, but the rest is history, as they say. The method worked. Um, there are portals like us all over the country, but we're unique. Most of the other state portals that are out there serve a single entity. For instance, the Secretary of State has some portals throughout the country with NIC or the, the Colorado the subsidiary of NIC. Or they work only for state government. As far as I know, we're the only portal that serves both state and local government. So we're kind of unique, I think, in all of the world. Uh, it's been exciting to, to grow and learn how that works. Uh, we only serve Colorado government. We don't serve the federal government. Uh, we don't serve nonprofits. We don't serve the private sector. But we do serve all of the rest of the local government state agencies, counties, municipalities, special districts, state control, public education, and higher public education are people that we serve. One of the things that our statute gives us is the ability to work with us, if you wish, without going out for an RFP. It's right in the statute itself. So it gives you the authority, if you like us, if you like the pricing that we're quoting, you can do so with the understanding that authority of the state statute allows you to do it without going out for an RFP. Certainly welcome to do that if you wish, but sometimes for a lot of projects it makes sense not to go the RFP route. Um, we, we have, in my mind, a partnership with whoever we work at. Every time I'm about to make the, the following statement, 
I always want to say, man, you know, let's make it a mental model, something that will, will happen. But in the history, since 2004, we've never partnered with either the state or local government where the project headed south. It blew up. We've never experienced that since 2004. Now, anybody who knows anything about IT knows that every project doesn't go exactly the way you think it's going to go. And there are bumps along the line, but we've never had a project completely blow up for a couple of reasons. One, as I said, we look at this relationship as a partnership. So one of the things that we're responsible for as your partner if we're working on projects together is to make sure we get across the finish line. We've had some of our partners go out of business halfway through the process. So it was our responsibility to go out, find somebody else who could do the work, pay them to do the work, and get that system across the finish line. There have been some cases where, knock on the wood again, where pricing didn't work out exactly for one reason or another. We step up to the, the plate and say, we, we said this is the price, that is going to be the price, we're going to get you across the, the finish line in terms of that. So that's kind of our responsibility as well, to make sure that if you partner with us, the partnership is successful. We are not all things to all people. We have to be very careful about the projects that, that we utilize. We carry our own liability insurance, our own cyber insurance, so we make sure that we're protected, we're protected in terms of, of that. But obviously there's limits. We carry what we thought was a pretty high limit of cyber insurance, $5 million worth of cyber insurance. Is that enough in this day and age? Who knows? Uh, it's hard to tell you whether that's enough or not. We carry some contingency funds. Our board uh, allows me to carry a certain amount of contingency funds. So if something is happening with the project and I need to bring some money to the table to get it across the table, within reason, I can do that. But again, we're not somebody who does a $100 million project. We're very careful in, as we analyze what projects we can do, because I've got to make sure that if something goes bad, my financial resources, my insurance will protect us and you to make sure we get across the issue. Working with us is pretty easy. Who, who's here for the first time? Wow, okay, welcome, welcome, glad you're here. With any government, we have what we call an eligible government agreement. Really, this is nothing more than an IGA, an intergovernmental agreement. And it says nothing more then the two of us agree to work together. It's about as difficult as it gets. Our EGE is on our website, so you can download it, take a look at it. And that's the first step, that we agree to work together. Then from that standpoint, based on the project, we fill out a work order or a task order, but that EGE is in effect until it's not, until you decide uh, to, to cancel the EGE. So you never have to fill it out more than once, one time. We're, we're ready to go in terms of the process itself. Um, most of our requests for service are online. Um, and, and our job is to connect you with a vendor that will fulfill the program, the task, the operation you're looking for. So we are a giant organization of seven and a half employees. <laughs> Most of what we do is contract and then observe the process, follow the process, and make sure that it's happening, being your partner in terms of that. But the vision for CIPA has always been to partner with private sector vendors to get what you want across the line. Many of our vendors have been at the request of our partners. They said, don't. A couple of years ago, people were really worried about cyber security and what was going on. And so now we brought on two new partners. We're looking at a third partner who will assist in those kinds of things. Used to be that particularly for small local government, gosh, this is never going to happen to us. We're, we're never going to have a ransom attack or a denial of service attack or any of those things. Well, I, I can tell you for a fact that many of our smaller governments in Colorado are starting to experience this kind of thing, so it's, it's topical for all of us. But as I said, it, uh, it is important that we contract with folks that, that you are looking to partner with. 
Um, simply two of the things that we do, this conference is a result, I think you heard me say this morning, this was our ninth conference. Uh, we put this on, there's no charge to our partners to participate in the conference. We love your feedback. Every year we get feedback of what worked and what didn't work. Feel free to do that. We want to listen and see what you need. We heard Chelsea this morning. We thought Chelsea was great. We're not partnered with their organization, but we thought the message that she had was important. So it's not just our partners that we bring to our user conferences, but people who are noteworthy, topical, interesting to our user group, our partners. We, we do have a micro-grant program. If you're new to SIPA, uh, this may be new to you. Um, we've been doing this again for nine years. We have shared, at this point, with the checks we'll give out this evening over the nine years, we've given out about a million dollars worth of micro-grants to state and local governments. We have six state agencies who are going to receive a check today for their program. And we've got about 23 local governments who will receive a check. Sometimes it's for as little as a couple of hundred dollars. That's what their request was. And our, our top uh, grant, we talked about the Little Gator Award, and that's going to be for $10,000 today. So those kind of small projects, it doesn't need to be partners that we use. It just needs to be a use that's important to us and a way for you to connect better with your citizens. That's what we're looking for in terms of that. The grants are all first reviewed by staff and then our board looks at them and says, yep, these are the grants that we want to award. We started at doing about $100,000 a year and now this year we'll probably be closer to about $160,000 in micro grants that are being out. This is my board. Uh, it's obviously changed over the last election. The governor has eight picks on our board. We have four legislators on our board. We have people from the private sector, three individuals that represent the private sector. We have one individual on, on the board. Where is, oh, there he is. Gilbert Ortiz, uh, who is the clerk in Pueblo County, is now serving my role on the board as local government. So local government has uh, an individual on the board. Secretary of State, by statute, serves on our board. Uh, the Chief Information Officer for the state, by statute, serves on our board. So our board is bigger than our staff. It's interesting. We have lots of bosses for a small staff. <laughs> this currently is a list of the vendors that we, we are currently using. Uh, most of them are here today. And again, this list is always percolating. So we, we take on new vendors. Old vendors go by the side if we're not using people uh, as we need. Uh, it's, it's always in transition. One of the things that we do through our self-funded model is that allows us to negotiate with these vendors at a savings to state and local government. So we, we have the purchasing power of the state. As I said, we are a self-funded organization. So we receive no dollars from the general fund. It all comes from operations uh, of our organization. The principal thing that, that keeps the lights on is payment processing. We receive a tiny amount from payment processing that pays salaries, rent, all of that. Uh, but again, we don't receive any dollars from the general fund, whether that's good or bad. Lots of arguments. I think it's good. It gives us a great deal of independence in terms of what we're doing. It's great not to have to go to the legislature every year and say, we need X dollars to keep the lights on. Um, we certainly have uh, cross jurisdictions, as we talked about, cost savings, I just talked about, uh, unique and creative solutions. People are not required or mandated to use us. If we don't have a good solution, you're not going to use us. So we need to build a better mousetrap, as they say. We're excited to be doing that. I love competition. I think it's a great thing. Again, we look at this group as our partners. We really do partner with you when we work on a, a project, as I said, to get us 
across the baseline. And our preference is for cloud-based solutions. We think that's where everything is going. Most of our vendors provide a cloud-based solution. We're connecting citizens to government through technology. That's really where our sweet spot is. Um, we don't sell hardware. We had a very large, large organization come to us and say, we're going to give you great discounts, and we want you to sell everything that we offer. One of those things is hardware. I would say, you won't be happy with us. We won't be happy with you. So we're very selective of the vendors that we choose. We really vet them pretty carefully. A new vendor typically will say, let's do a pilot project. Let's give really high discounts for somebody to do the pilot project. If it works out, then we'll consider a long-term relationship. But we don't jump at every vendor that comes across to us. And you can imagine, I get phone calls every week of vendors who would like to work with us for one reason or another. And we have to be pretty slack and say, no, that's really not what we do. Um, our portal integrator, Colorado Interactive, is the one that we are required by statute to go out for an RFP. We just concluded some negotiations that extended their contract another three years. Um, so three years from now, we'll be going out for another portal contract, and at least we can catch our breath for three years before we need to start doing that. Um, as I said, this is a very large organization, NIC, that runs portals in 28 states. One of the nice things about the way they run a portal is they bring local people to Colorado. So CI has about 36, Seven. 37 employees, full-time employees, that work in Colorado full-time for us. They don't work for anybody else outside of that. They don't work for the private sector. They don't work for other governments. They basically are full-time employees here in Colorado. The help desk that they run is here in Colorado full-time, only for our use. Um, and they understand the product. So when people call and need assistance, one of the last things that we did with this light latest contract is negotiate SLAs around the help desk. So they're required to answer a call in a reasonable amount of time. And more important than that, they're required to solve the problem within a reasonable amount of time through contract with, with us, uh, which I think is great. It's one thing to take the problem. It's another thing to make sure that it gets solved. And there are penalties in our contract if they don't perform the next, which is great. It's not just we'll see what happens. There's actually a dollar penalty that happens if they're not controlling the SLAs. So, with that, I'd like to bring on our portal integrator. Uh, Marty Hartley is the Director of Portal Operations here in Colorado. Marty is a ex-local government guy. He worked for Jefferson <laughs> County before going to Colorado Interactive, so he understands government in Colorado. Uh, so, Marty, welcome. Take it away. Thank you. Jack. You know, as Jack mentioned, I did work for, prior to coming to Colorado Interactive, Jefferson County in the IT department for almost 20 years. Started as a COBOL programmer, uh, working on an assessor system, and then moved on to the tensions management system. Before that, I was in the banking industry, so I've been around IT my entire career. Uh, I've been in it long enough to where I've actually punched cards professionally, so um, it's, been, it's been a great journey so far to see all of the changes. Um, as Jack mentioned, he gave you a good background of NIC, um, and we do have our offices just a couple of blocks from here, so we're, we are very proud of our local presence and the folks that we have here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. It's going to be pretty high level. There's a couple of um, sessions today that are more, that are very focused on a few of the services that we provide. Payment processing and security will be one of them. Um, we have a session on our content management system and another one on um, a platform that we call App Engine. So what I'm going to give you today is just going to be a just kind of a taste of what we do, um, and then we'll have some time I think at the end for some questions. But if you have 
uh, an interest in any of these topics that I just mentioned, there's, there's opportunities to get more information about those further in the day. So as Jack mentioned, our core competency, our major service is payment processing. So we have a couple of different options for that. We have the traditional payment processing, which is online payments, as well as over-the-counter payments, if you have an office where you're taking those payments. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can, um, in addition to those traditional methods that I'll give you, um, with our service, there's no cost to set up our service at all or to implement it. Uh, the model is based on a self-funded model where you can pass, there's an option to either pass those fees on to your customers or you can absorb the fees if you have the budget to do that. Um, there's been some great changes recently with how we can depict service fees for a very long time and it was frustrating to customers, to agencies, and to us. We could not depict the actual service fee. That was because of some rules that Visa had in place. Those recently changed. We're able to now, and agencies are able to upfront let people know what those fees are. So for credit cards, there's a 2.25% charge uh, for whatever amount you're, you're purchasing plus the se a 75 cent fee, service fee. For ACH or AD check, it's $1 flat rate any amount. So we're pretty excited about that. The first implementation that we did for that was for the drive system. Um, as you can imagine, that's the biggest, one of the biggest systems used across the state. Um, Department of Revenue, Colorado Interactive. We got a lot of uh, feedback and suggestions from the customers uh, about that lack of transparency. So we are really happy to be able to put that in. And then we're working on the rest of our systems, uh, putting that transparency in place. And I think we'll answer a lot of questions and concerns from folks. Uh, PCI, we're PCI level one compliant, which is the highest level of PCI compliance that you can have, um, which means that we have to do a lot of security scans, we have to have independent validation of our security measures, we have various reports, SOC 1, SOC 2 reports, full transparency on how our systems are secured and the audits that take place. Um, we have a, an option, this one here, the, the second to the last. I think we have a slide for that. We have a mobile app um, that you can take payments on. It's, it's pretty neat for places where if you have a, a need to take a payment but you're out of Wi-Fi or cell phone range, you can still take that payment and then sync it up later on once we get into uh, uh, coverage. So a couple of use cases for that, uh, Phillips County. Um, has a, a campground that they have in their, um, in their fairgrounds, which the reception there is not so great um, sometimes. So they use this on the go app. And then we also just recently did one for um, the town of Lyman. They have a golf tournament and they do kind of some fundraising through that golf tournament. So it's kind of a, a, a neat little app for a, a very specific use case um, for that disconnected payment processing. Um, a big, another big marquee service that we offer is our content management system. Our content management system is based on Drupal. Um, Drupal is uh, it's been around for a while. It's uh, high. It's in a, a lot of use across the globe. It's very well supported. It has a community of developers that contribute to the Drupal platform, and so it's uh, we think one of the best platforms out there. We take that Drupal platform and then we create our own distribution of that platform specific for government agencies. So it really becomes like a site builder. Um, if you use that platform, then we give you the tools and the training necessary to create your content within that platform. Um, we're, we're getting very close uh, to moving to our new version of the platform, which is going to be based on Drupal 8. Did you have a question? How close? Um, July. July is when we expect to start moving people into that platform. Um, so that new platform, if you're using the platform now, um, it's going to be a lot different. It's going to give you a lot more flexibility. It's a completely different architecture on the back end. Um, rather than having a shared database, it's going to be individual databases for each site. Uh, you're going to be able to do some pretty cool things. So we're really excited about that coming in July. 
Um, I think Jack may have mentioned it earlier this morning. This morning. Um, what I really like about the platform is it gives you the ability to create your own content. We don't get involved in your content at all. That's all you know your, your constituents best. You know what you need to do best. And we've seen some great things come out of that model. This year we've had four agencies that have won Horizon Interactive Awards. It's a national, it's an international competition for uh, websites. There was a, there's another award organization called the Davy Awards. Uh, Morgan County got one of those awards. So it really gives you the tools to create award-winning sites. Uh, Jack talked a little bit about this in the keynote as well. Another service that we provide is online forms. Um, and, and it's really more than just a form. Uh, we refer to it as App Engine, which is really a platform that we can use to create custom applications. It's a platform that enables us to rapidly develop applications. So it can be as simple as just a data collection form, but you can also build in, we can also build in logic behind it for anything from a low to medium complexity business solution. So we've created um, apps for building permits. Um, we've done a couple for the Department of Agriculture. So it's a great tool to rapidly create a, an application. Um, most of the stuff we do it, we can do it no cost. In fact, we have not charged anybody to create one of these app engine applications. So um, they can be standalone, they can do a payment cost, we can take a payment with them. It's a great tool if you have uh, a need for a custom application. Uh, Jack mentioned event registration. If you have an event that you would like to uh, you know, gather those registrations, we have a tool for that. You can charge or not charge for those events. It's configurable. And then the, the little mobile app, uh, the My Events To Go. That's a, that's a great way to save some money if you, if you have a conference and you don't want to print a bunch of material and brochures. Those are all both available at no cost through our contract. So here's just a little bit, uh, kind of CI by the numbers. Uh, these are all based on 2018. We, we processed 6.9 million transactions. Yesterday was a busy day for us because we do all of the transactions for the Department of Revenue, Revenue Online. So um, I think by noon we had done 5,500 transactions or something that of $13 million. I imagine that went up the closer to the deadline that it got. Um, but, but we do all of those transactions. We do all of the transactions for drives, for your vehicle renewals, for your driver's license renewals. So we've got some pretty big heavy hitters in terms of the payment processing with, with state departments. Um, and then we're also doing you know, uh, payment processing for uh, a small, small rural towns that maybe only need a, a solution to take two or three payments a month. But we're happy to do all of those and, and everything in between. Again, all at no cost. $1.8 billion is what we securely process. Um, and you can see the rest of those. Um, we've got uh, a Gov, we'll get to a slide here in a minute called gov to go It's a mobile app. We've got 11,000 over 11,000 users that have accounts on the gov to go app so far. We'll get a little bit more about that. So I want to give you a couple of examples of folks that are using this. So you, you hear about these products and you're like, well, who's actually using these? A couple of examples of, of um, deployments that we have locked, launched in the first quarter of this year. So you can see all of these, these entities here are using a product called Payport. Payport is a standalone web-based application, allows you to create um, an interface that's configurable for whatever you need to take a payment for. It can be water payments, it can be parking tickets, it can be traffic, whatever the need is. Gives you the power to create that, um, that item within the product, put a SKU on it. If you're a state agency and you need to use Core, all of our payment systems integrate with the Core. Uh, system. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to create a standalone web based payment integration or payment portal. We also have payment integrations. Uh, integration is uh, we have a set of APIs that we can provide a vendor 
um, or a proprietary system. And you can take those APIs, put it into your solution, and then once you get to the point where you need to make a payment, you get directed to our secure payment processing system. So all of these entities are examples of payment integrations that we have launched this quarter. Um, common use cases are um, short-term rentals. I think uh, Golden, perhaps Summit County might be short-term rentals. We see a lot of integrations with utility systems for water payments, that sort of thing. Um, we're pretty excited about Crowley County. Up until just um, this last quarter, they were not taking any payments for drives. Um, now, they may not have a, a big need for that, but uh, uh, the clerk and recorder was pretty excited about getting the ability to take payments for the drive system. On the go is the mobile app that I was uh, discussing earlier. Um, and here's a few of those folks that are using the, uh, that went live with On The Go last quarter. And then uh, these are a few websites that we just launched this quarter for the Drupal content management system. Oops. App Engine, another example, this is the custom form builder that I mentioned. Uh, we set up three different types of forms for Colorado River Fire Rescue. Last slide I want to talk about today is Gov2Go. Gov2Go um, launched in 2018. In May of 2018, we added the ability to uh, renew a vehicle online through Gov2Go. So right now, Gov2Go has a few built-in services, vehicle renewals, you can get voter information, what those key dates for voting are. You can get Amber Alerts. Um, you can get alerts for state holidays. But what I really want to emphasize about Gov2Go is Gov2Go is a platform also, like App Engine, that allows us to create custom services. The, the main use case for Gov2Go is it's a notification to folks to take action. The, the, the vehicle renewal is a, is a prime example. You know you got to do that every year. You know you're going to get the card in the mail. Maybe, maybe it'll get lost, but you can get that notification in Gov2Go and right within the app, you can make that payment. You can store your payment information securely within the app. But if you think about any other use cases that you might have with your citizens, we can build custom services for Gov2Go. So if you have folks that need to know about a utility payment, um, we're exploring some new service options. They're not available yet about um, an ad hoc notification system if you need to send out a message to your constituents. Um, we're exploring the idea of uh, enabling um, proactive input from a citizen like a 311 type of thing. So they're not ready yet, but those are some things that are that we're looking at our roadmap, but the notification piece of that is available right now. So think about that. Think about any kinds of use case that you might have with that, and we would be happy to talk to you about what possibilities exist for using Gov2Go. Mark, can I make a couple of comments? Absolutely. One of the things that, that's kind of been a, a dream of mine for a long time was that our, our citizens don't really care whether we're the state or the county or the municipality or a special district. They don't care. All they want to do is do their business with us and, and move on to uh, something else. And when I saw this application, I got pretty darn excited because this was, in my opinion, one of the first opportunities where we could bring all government together, a single application that looks the same for no matter what type of government you're, you're looking at. So I, I'm very, very excited about this application and what it has to offer. We're going to talk to counties and municipalities about being part of it. The federal government is part of it right now. You can, you can re get a pass for a national park on go to go right now. So there are other pieces that give us that, that capability. One of the problems, of course, I'm kind of a practical guy, and I said, you know, <coughs> after a period of time, we're going to go out to a contract with a, another portal integrator 
here we are spending a lot of effort to get people signed up for gov to go we move to another port and integrator loop that's never going to happen already. thank you Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but in case it did one of the things that we negotiated in our last contract is that we get the option to use this into perpetuity whether we're using nic as our portal integrator or not that was one of the big issues for me to make sure that if we're going to put time and effort in this thing that it's going to be around. It's launched in all 50 states, so another aspect is somebody could be using it in Arkansas, come to Colorado, and boy, it looks pretty much the same. It acts pretty much the same. Again, my dream of bringing all these governments together, I think this has great opportunity. To do that. Sorry. No, that was great. Thank you very much. I, th I think actually that's um, the last thing. Oh, yes. good. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you give a little demonstration or maybe some of the workshops I've got to go? Because I, I haven't used it. So Are you doing that in the workshop over here? If, if, you, if you stop by where all the vendor space is, we'd be happy to show you exactly what it looks like. Pretty easy to use. Pretty intuitive. Um, I, I was able to use it, so that tells you it should be pretty easy to use. I claim that I was the first to use it. Uh, I, I still claim that I was the first use it at 3 o'clock in the morning when it went live. I wanted to renew my license plate right there. So then do people register and it's tailored to maybe your local government and then they can expand and opt into lots of other options? Yeah, the vision is that, that you, you opt in and you opt for the services you want. So maybe all I want is notification. I don't, I don't want to do my license plates. I just want to tell me why the flag's at half mast, right? So. Uh, you'll be able to opt in and choose exactly what it is that, that you want. Or opt that back out if you're, if you're unhappy with this one. Um, for the on-the-go app, do we have to submit and um, like an request to get that for the specific entities that we have? Yeah, so we'll need to, one, one have an EGE. Okay. Uh, and then second, there's, there's online where you can say, here's, here's the application we, we want. That. So pretty much everything can be done online. And Jack, you, you just reminded me of something. Thank you. There are a couple of new services that are actually imminent. One is the sex offender registry notification. So it, we've we've built we're building that into Gov2Go. It's the same service that you can get through CBI right now. That'll be launched probably by the end of the month. Um, and the next one is the flag status that Jack mentioned. Um, that is a wildly popular service on the governor's site. When that is gone or it doesn't work, the phones ring off the hook. Um, so we are putting that in cup to go as well. And that'll launch? Uh, probably again by the end of the month. Yeah, it's amazing. When we look at the governor's website and we host the, the governor's website, in fact, the governor's gonna launch a new website tomorrow -ish. Probably tomorrow, <laughs> yep. tomorrow -ish. Uh, but that's the number one thing that, that people go to the governor's website. Why are the flags at half mast? So here we'll get notification of something to sign up for, and so you'll, you'll get notified, hey, the flags are at half mast, here's, here's why. Also, one of the neat things about it, when, when Drives was up and working, if you're familiar with that project, one of the things that happened was that the local clerk and recorder motor vehicle offices were closed for a couple of days because of the Drives project. Well, as Marty says, this is a notification system. So the people who were signed up for gun to go got notification that those motor vehicle sites would be closed. So those kinds of notifications are certainly possible. A flood, all those kinds of things we're pretty excited about as being no cost to the citizen, but notification in terms of some of those things that are going on in, in the state. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions for SIPA. One is, do you have, uh, for your vendors, do you have any preferences to use uh, Colorado-based or, or ones with a uh, large Colorado presence? And the other is, what's your feedback mechanism on current vendors? Great question. Did everybody here, do we, do we give preference to Colorado vendors? And second, do we have feedback on our, our vendors? The answer is, number one is the solution itself. So that probably trumps everything else, is this is a solution that people actually want. 
but we, we do love working with, with a lot of Colorado vendors. Um, we have a number that are Colorado specific on, uh, on our relationship, so that's probably number two in terms of our process. One, is it a solution that people want, and two, is it, is it local? One of the things that probably the staff doesn't like me talking about is we are a launching pad for a lot of Colorado vendors that maybe the state doesn't want to take the risk working with. They don't carry enough insurance, they might have not been around long enough, and so forth. So part of what we do is kind of accept risk. We've had Colorado vendors that we've had and have gone out of business, and you know that's just part of, part of the process. But we have several integrators that are, are local to Colorado and a couple of vendors that are, are unique to AL Docs is a, uh, we talked about this morning, is a local Colorado vendor, which we're pretty excited about. Offer a really nice service. So whenever we can, we can. Feedback. Feedback is important. When you do a project with us, uh, you'll be contacted probably by Beth or Jamie in our office and said, how is it going? What's happening? Et cetera, et cetera. So we love feedback. Every year, we sit down as a group analyze the feedback we've gotten with a particular vendor, and sometimes that makes the decision whether we're going to maintain that vendor or not. Are we getting the kind of feedback that, that we need? But in addition to that, feel like you can pick up the phone and call us at any time if, if something is going on with a vendor that you need, we need to be aware of. Um, you, we also, kind of related, there's going to be a, a presentation at lunch about a, a new product, Wisply, which is the ability to notify folks anonymously in terms of that. And one of the things we're looking for, if you want to stay anonymous but tell us something about a vendor, you can go online, leave us that information, and we will certainly log in and repeat. And we can communicate back and forth, and you still stay anonymous, which is a pretty slick system. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. All the apps, platforms, are they all ad-free, no advertisements? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, you know, your, your information, your data stays private. We don't sell data. Uh, it's not part of it. CI does not well, sell data except for certain data. Correct. We do have a contract with the Department of Revenue for bulk data. And those that's sold, there's very specific rules about how you can sell that, who you can sell it to, how it's used um, for motor vehicle, for drivers, for crash information. And those are, those are sold typically to insurance companies and institutional kinds of um, companies. Experian, Polk, that sort of thing. They have to be registered to receive the data though. Not anybody can ask. Yeah, that. there's an application process and a vetting process, and like I said, they have there's very specific rules about how that data can be used. We don't sell any personal data, so that personal data is not included unless it's a specific driver record, which is something that a say a commercial somebody that's doing CDL checks would have to know. But insurance companies have been buying driving records forever. But it's not sold for marketing purposes at all only determine whether you're going to get the insurance or not. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, on the notifications then, is that, can, do we, can we set it up that it's only our notifications that get sent out, or does it, would it be everything like why the flags are a gas staff? Or? So, so it, the, the, the program is driven by the citizen who who signs up for it. So our vision is, let's say that you live in or Adams County. So you can sign up to get information about Adams County. The flag is, is going to be up to the person who's signing up for the application. So some people will sign up for Grab to Go, but they don't care about the flag. They're not going to ask for flag information. You have to ask for it to get it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, sir. So in the notification system, 
how does, so I'm, I work at a higher ed institution, um, so if we wanted to deliver specific content, what's our time? We have a portal, do we upload that notification? What's the turnaround time on that? That's a great question, I love that question. It is, um, now this, the notification system is still under design. So it's not, so Jack was mentioning that you can, let me just put it this way. The ad hoc notification system is under development. So the piece that's gonna give an organization like Higher Ed the ability to send out a specific message, that's something we're working on right now. We do have a few of the services that are already in there that are also notification based, but they're not the ad hoc piece yet. Um, but we would be lo we would love to talk to you, anybody else, about um, what particular use cases you would see beneficial as we're putting together that ad hoc notification. So, in great discussion, we've been talking about this. Our vision is that the entity would have the ability to send out their own notifications. So it wouldn't have to go through any kind of red tape, whatever. The question is, and would love to, to talk to higher ed about it, we also want to be careful that somebody on your behalf is sending out false information about your higher ed organization. So really it has more to do with governance. How, what is the governance model that, that makes sense that we can use? But our vision at this point is the entity should be able to send out their information. So right now with, with the vehicle renewals, there, that, that notification is sent out because we have the ability to tap into the drive system. We re, you, when, you, when you use Gov2Go, you enter your plate number, we validate your plate, plate number against the drives database. Now we know exactly when your vehicle is up for renewal. So we send that notification proactively, the system does, proactively about renewing your vehicle. The other notification piece, the ad hoc piece, is going to be whenever uh, you feel it's a good time to send out the message. So that's the piece that we're working on to put up those guardrails to make sure that we have an interface that's going to be safe and secure to use. If that, if that helps with But it's a high the priority, you have to have that the notification pretty quickly. That's my question, do you have an idea of when? Uh, we're, no, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, let's just put it this way. I would hope that we'd be able to put that out by the end of the year. Okay. Huge priority for me. Jack has me on speed dial, <laughs> so. <laughs> He won't let it drop, I guarantee it. Yes, sir. Is the notification, is it the idea that all notifications can be opted into? Like, so there's no, Absolutely. Like, I can't upload my list, like these are the only people who should get this. It's, if you click on this, you can get it. Correct. The whole vision is for the citizen to have control, to feel like they, they have control over, over the process. So. And if, you, and if you stop by our, our table, we can show you the interface. And you can see pretty clearly, you know, you will have a, a list of services that you can opt in and out of. So you can kind of see what the paradigm looks like um, and, ha and how it might look uh, going forward. Yeah, the vision, of course, and, and they did quite a bit of uh, customer research in terms of the project itself. But one of the things that, that Citizen was saying is, we, we want to be controlled. I don't want to sign up for something and then every five minutes I get notifications that I don't want. So that's kind of the vision as, as it was designed. But they did a lot of study with actual citizens about what do you want, what should this look like, how should it work. And that was one of the things that citizens said, I want to be controlled. Um, just on the notification system, um, you know, I Absolutely. So we have a portal in New Jersey, uh, and they have this service set up for their business filings through the Secretary of State's office. So they have, I don't know the, ex I want to say, I mean, it's in the hundreds of thousands of users that are in that. So there's also the ability to um, onboard automatically. So right now you have to go, you have to download the app anyway, but, you know, to create an account, you have to go through a very deliberate process to create your account your, and that sort of thing. There's also the ability to, once you have the app, create an account through an automated process. And that's the way the Secretary of State has set it up in New Jersey. 
once you do that initial um, creation of your business, then you're onboarded for those notifications going forward through Gov2Go. Uh, and, and we also just kind of a... Well, I mean, this is Gary Zimmerman. He works with the Secretary of State's office. We currently do notifications, but the, um, the profile that leads to an entity creation, that would be unique and you know, incremental what we currently provide. No pressure on me to have this big room and you said, <laughs> no, it's good. See how I burst. <laughs> Speaking of that, I, um, so last year we launched an application called My Biz Colorado, which is uh, kind of a business one-stop. Uh, that was developed uh, by CI as well as a subcontractor that we use to do that. So you heard some folks talking this morning about Google Cloud Platform. That application is built on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, it allows you to go through all the processes. It connects to the Secretary of State in order, if you want to create your business right there, um, interacts with Department of Revenue and CDLE for wage withholding for sales tax. Um, so that's been a pretty big success so far. So we think that's going to get broadened and expanded. We hope that it'll eventually uh, somehow tie in with the municipalities and counties as well. Just because you can open a business in Colorado doesn't mean you can open a business in Denver or Aurora or Colorado Springs. And so. Uh, it's an evolving thing, as we heard uh, Ms. Bright talk this morning. Once you develop something, it's not one and done. It's an ongoing process to make sure that we're, we're serving citizen needs in terms of that. But a really a pretty exciting economic development tool. Uh, and, and I think we're going to get national awards as, as a result of how it was developed. Other questions? I think we're exactly on time to take a break. Thank you. I'll be around all day. If you have questions specifically, I know Marty will be around. Ask us individually if you have questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>